All right, here we go. Welcome to Tuesday. I yeah, I need to stop saying the day because obviously best of shows. Shout out. Um, this is Browner and Lawhead on the Mightier 1090 ESPN. That was not an error. That's just how I start the show. Who cares? Eat it. I'm John Browner, joined by Jason Lawhead here in Southern California on the Mightier 1090 ESPN. We're available on the iTunes podcast store, and we're also available on YouTube under Kaplan and Crew. All you have to do is search that to find that. What's up, Jason? What's going on? I see that we're oh, wearing the same. We're matching. We're matching today. It's a nice sweatshirt. Selling merch. Selling merch. Nice sweatshirt weather. Not much, man. You know, Tuesday, another day. Uh, Just uh, waiting to hear what you have to say. How about that? A little poetry. A little spoken word out of the gate. Um, I'll start you with this. Okay. There's some things. There's a gnat in here. It's killing me. There's a thing that we all hold near and dear to our hearts. Some of us hold it closer to our balls than we even know. It's a cell phone. Hmm. And in said cell phone, when things change in said cell phone, it is very important that you are aware of what is and isn't in the cell phone. Something big is happening in your cell phone. I don't know if you know, Jason, I don't know if you know. So I'm going to try to help people break down what is what I'm talking about. Okay? Okay. If you own an iPhone, mm -hmm. every time it updates, you may be pissed iOS 16 is coming out. iOS 16 may have the greatest feature in a phone that we've all needed and we never found. The delete text message. Not off your phone. Off of the person you sent it to. Really? Now we talking iPhone. Now we talking iOS. Because you know how many texts I wish I could take back? You know how many wrong persons I've sent and had to explain back in my younger days? Where were you when I was 20, iPhone, iOS 16? Where were you when I needed you? I don't need it now. I'm a settled man. By settled, I mean I'm settled in this seat. Where were you then? Where were you then? Jason, are you pumped for the ability to be able to erase a unwanted sent text message. I mean, I'm not pumped. No, I think I'm at that point where do I wish that feature was around earlier? Sure. But have I learned my lesson from times in the past that I think I've gotten <laughs> to the point now where I'm, I'm very safe as even to what I say over the phone, because who knows if that person is hitting record um with the features that are already out there so have you ever have you ever sent your wife a text message and you were like ah oh, i didn't mean to say that um and then you get in trouble i i guess maybe i've sent somewhere i've been like back afterwards like you know what like I, I i shouldn't even have sent this text i'm sorry that i even mentioned it i think yeah <laughs> like where but you know what that's natural i think that that has sometimes sometimes those um those hiccups in communicating are the way you fix things in the long run instead of skipping over them and saying, you know, maybe sometimes, and I've always been a kind of guy that says what I think I've been able to harness the impulse of saying a lot of things that, um, I don't really mean that I may have used to when I was younger in temperamental stages of my life. But now as I've gotten older and I've narrowed my relationships in life down to, to very few, you know, um, people that need to hear from me, uh, <laughs> um, I think I, I feel safer from that standpoint. So Pump. Gotcha. I'm not like super pumped. I can see where people would be. I can see, like I said, stages in my life where that would have been better. Or if I was at a certain age now that I wasn't, then I'd be like, yeah, man. Oh, that's going to be awesome. Um, so, yeah, I can definitely see where the that is a significant new feature 
in uh, in the the world of people who communicate, and especially the people who have kind of grown up on technology and social and all those yeah, things, man. man. Like it, that is a game changer for them, no doubt. The drunk text hurt or helped a lot of situations. Mm -hmm. So I, I what I and what I will follow that up with saying is I've always had to learn the difference between saying being able to say whatever you want being able to say what comes to your mind mm -hmm. and not having to filter then meaning what you say because the difference between those can save you a lifetime of embarrassment pain and hurt so that's a, that's just a little something from the the chitter chatter section because we, we do lawheads baseball chitter chatter yeah that's, hey batter batter chitter chatter something like yeah. i don't know what i said but uh better yeah. lawheads better better <laughs> chitter chatter <laughs> Yeah, that's the technology. So that's what the new chatter. update is? Because I'm getting that update. Do it tonight. Do it tomorrow. So that newest update on the iPhone is going to have this feature now, is what you're telling me. It's like uh, they've got like 15 different new features. They basically stole something from every other service. Like okay. WhatsApp allows you to delete messages. Okay. Um, uh, 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 they do have a cool feature on because obviously I'm super into this. They have another feature on there that allows your phone to become a webcam. I mean, if people so, already read the message, though, you're, you know. What if they didn't? Maybe, they, maybe. No, I'm saying. Maybe, they, I'm saying if people already did, because some people don't have that feature that shows you if they read it or not. Like some people, right. you know, like I, there's some people I text. Well, I never have that on. Right. I just have you. Some no. people, I just have the delivered on. You don't know whether I, I don't even got that. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's smart. So, but you don't know. You could be like, oh, I deleted phone. that. But does that person know? Will that person say anything? Uh, did they read it? Did they screen cap it before I deleted it? Oh, God, what do I got to worry about that? Um, so I don't know. I don't know how that's all going to. That's just going to make, you know, more anxieties and emotions for people. <laughs> then now there's just this like almost purgatory uh, part of the iPhone that you weren't sure if that existed or not because you knew back in the day, once you said it, they're eventually going to read it, right? Like, I can't take right. that back. Now you're not going to know. You're going to have this, like, weird, like, did they? They may have and aren't just saying anything. They're acting weird. But I think that they would be madder if they read it. I don't know. So there's going to be all this kind of <laughs> inner monologues going on with people ever since this update. It's going to be hilarious. I, I I can guarantee you Blake Snell wish he had the iOS deleted sent text message on De performances last delete night. Delete inning. Because <laughs> he was terrible. Terrible. Now, he he fought through it. I'll give him credit for this. <laughs> yeah, but. Blake Snell fought through what happened last night. He only ended up going four innings. He gave up another run in the fourth inning. But he fought through what happened to him to start the first inning of that game. And I think it was important for him to do that. I also think it was important for Bob Melvin to see him do that. But to throw that many pitches in the first inning, to issue three walks in the first inning, to just look to have zero command in the first inning when the when the Mets were obviously not swinging the bat, they were going to make him throw strikes on anything not a fastball. So they had their game plan to him to a T, and he failed. And so for him to be able to battle his way back through that, I would give him not an F, because I think that killed the energy of the team until Luke Voigt, who it looks like if he ever makes any contact with the ball, it's either going over the fence or going right up in the air. Mm -hmm. So I don't like I hopefully they'll do better tonight. You Darvish is on the mound tonight. We're looking to get back 500 against good teams and the Mets are a good team. They are a good team. And that's a lineup that, you know, smell Snell probably probably looked at going into thinking, you know, maybe I can try to pitch around guys and get them to swing at some bad pitches and get some easy outs early the first time through the order. And mm -hmm. they were going to be patient. They, you know, they, they probably knew that this is uh, going to be this guy's game plan. Let's get him on a high pitch count because he'll be run. He'll be run quick once he gets thrown pitches, which eventually happened he got the 95 pitches but he only threw 59 strikes whoo that's a lot of balls and uh <laughs> that is i mean i don't I mean, I mean it make it sound funny you know uh like a nightclub in here yeah press. exactly right <laughs> there's a lot there was a lot 
you know, I, mean, I don't know. But in at least in Hillcrest, they hit the uh, more of them paint the strike zone at least. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, so yeah, I mean, but the Mets are a good offense, and Darvish is going to have to come at them, challenge them early, and try to get you know let the defense do the work, let the defense make some outs, trust the defense, try to get out of the you know first couple of innings unscathed without many base runners and because if the Mets get guys on base they're gonna get them in the way they've been playing this year they did that to the bullpen too so even when Snell went yes. out that Mets lineup kept kept attacking kept attacking kept attacking and they said they chopped that bullpen down too so it's key that Darvish comes out and shows you know this type of front running type of team top division contender in the National League that um, we've got an arm that can shut you down. I think that's a big, big start for them tonight. Because even if Snell would have lost last night, but was able to maybe get in six and you know maybe get you know, only a few earned runs, you'd, you'd be happy about what that meant. But uh, I think that puts a little bit more pressure on Darvish to really show what he can do to this lineup tonight. You know, I think that that I I gotta be honest. I never give baseball managers credit for game plans. I, I, just, I just don't. I know that there's a ton of strategy behind the fielding, the defensive portion of it. But the idea that the Mets had a game plan of just let them throw, make them throw strikes, and did use that exact same plan against the bullpen, hey, let's let them throw strikes and see what happens. And they didn't. And when they did, they smacked them. So, I, I mean, this, the guy who had the, the, the hit for the cycle, like, come on, bro. And he was their worst batter. The guy who hit for a cycle right. last night was the worst, had the worst well, batting average on the entire roster for right. But when you're walking guys and your hitters are ahead in the count, I mean, these are still professional hitters. You put a you put a 240 hitter ahead in the count with guys on base, and he's a way better hitter, right? You get him in choices that he knows this guy's got to make a strike. He's not just going to pitch me a strike or or fool me on something. Um, whereas, you know, I think that, you know, Snell's probably just better off right now at, at saying attack the strike zone, have him put it in play. Um, and maybe I can, you know, get, get some guys uh, out on change ups and changes of speeds and, you know, looking for this pitch. And, and so, you know, uh, Darvish is a real good experienced pitcher and he's been able to, you know, Pitch him, pitch his way out of jams. Every pitcher has bad outings, but Darvish has always been known to either give you a great outing, have the chance to pitch out of jams, um, and and hang around. So, uh, I, I look for Darvish to be that guy tonight. To you know, it's it it's expected of him. I think right now. So another thing that's <clears throat> unexpected. Yesterday, when we talked about the Phil Mickelson mm -hmm. situation, I did not expect to come back here today and see another person jump ship on the PGA Tour. That person is now Dustin Johnson. And I know to some people, golf is such a small group of people that you're having a conversation with. So I'm going to make this very common with people. Wouldn't you leave your job for more money? <clears throat> wouldn't, wouldn't you leave the current job that you have to make more money in another business that does the same uh, 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 thing that you left. Like, I would work at Burger King and switch to McDonald's if they were paying more. I would go from Microsoft to Apple if they were paying more. That's all this is. The idea that the PGA is being so, I want to use gentle words, a baby, and I want to use another B word, but I can't, a baby about competition coming into the, into the sport that it's it's kind of embarrassing for them. Like, this, I don't like when a sport or anything has had such a large run-up of success. And now all of a sudden, here comes a competitor, and you don't really challenge the competitor to make sure that you stay two steps ahead of them. You get mad at the people competing in your sport for even thinking of going to do this somewhere else. I find that to be very childish, and I find it to be bad business, to be 100% honest with you. You know, it's it's a one of those what 
what is conventional what isn't conventional more arguments i think of the way this is kind of looked at in frame i think the pga tour i think um the the home the opportunities that, that the pga tour has created for the golfer and the uh the game they see this differently they see the saudi arabian government as a you know integral part of what is happening here okay um but and, you can't but okay so let me ask you a question and i oh, think that oh, that oh. is a i think that's the start i don't even think they feel you know the saudis have so much money right the saudis have so much money they're not even really looking for tv contracts or deals they're, but, let me, but, but hold okay. on hold on let me ask you a let me ask you a question because you brought up the you brought up the saudis and their atrocities and their human right. rights violations and what they did to the, the right. uh jamal Khashoggi, the reporter for the washington mm -hmm. post who who they murdered and that's not a secret that's not me that's not hyperbole they right. chopped him up mm -hmm. it, it it they did it we, if you're, if, if any person, any individual's main complaint is that they're doing business with the Saudis who are basically funding this tournament or funding this league. So therefore, we can't be in favor of anybody joining it. Then that would mean that we as a country needs to look at all our relationships. We have massive, China's a massive business partner with every consumer in this country. Sure. Are we not an ally? I think it's a human rights violation. There's stuff in your house, not you, everyone right now that you bought in the last six months from China. Did you not buy it because it was from China? You did business with them, not you, but I'm speaking of everybody in general. So the, the complaint that a lot of people are having is with this whole the Saudi business. Like, okay, well, look in your kitchen. Mm -hmm. Look at your TV. Look you ain't mad at that. Look in your oil, your gas tank. No, I'm saying what the perception I think is what what is started, what how it started with the PGA and where it's yeah. carried, where it's carried into now. And but now that's a talking point from them. That's not that's not good business. That's them using that as a way to try to get public sentiment on their side. When in, in actuality, they need to be focused on their own business. And I hope the Saudis crush the PGA tour. I really do. <laughs> Not because I don't like the PGA Tour. I just don't like when people try to do that. Don't try to take someone else down because you don't want to build, you don't want to lift yourself up. Lift yourself up. Don't worry about what somebody else is saying. Don't worry about what somebody else is doing because at the end of the day, it's your responsibility to take care of your own business. So you should never have to down talk somebody else to lift yourself up. Right. Yeah, no, I mean, it's a, it's a fair argument. It's, it's, uh, you know, and when you're a golfer, you're, you go where the money is, I guess you go. And, you know, I, I just feel like eventually there's going to be some type of, you know, it, the weird part for me about getting a grasp on the whole thing is, is they're paying, I mean, what do they give Dustin Johnson? 150 million. Is that the number? $25 million. $125 million. Uh -huh. They gave Phil Mickelson $200 million. Ain't nobody turning that money down. Dustin Johnson ain't going to make that on the tour. Well, Phil that's Mickelson the thing is, you know, to, if, you were to, if, if you were to average the, let's say, the winning number of uh, the person and what the number one pays, right? Some are higher than others. Some are on the lower end of a million. Some are closer to two million for first place. Let's say the average, if you were to win tour week after week is 1.5. I mean, the Saudis just cut a check to Dustin Johnson, basically saying, here's 125 PGA tournament wins in a row. Right here. Here it is. 1.25 million, let's say, is let's say is the average if, if you were to earn first place. One to five. 100, so 20 million, 200 million for that's like 200. That's almost 200 tournaments in a row. That's like telling Phil Mickelson, here's a check. That basically is the equivalent of winning 200 consecutive PGA Tour events. And then after that, you also you get, get to still earn and make events, more money. Now, where the person these events will be 10 to $15 million because our money is endless. Like, come on, right. man. Now, now, at some point, 
My problem with this is, though, once you go get the Phil Mickelsons, the Sergio Garcias, the guys, and even the guys that are still good golfers, uh, you know, eventually Phil's going to get a little older. I know he just won a PGA last year, but you know what I mean, uh, Sergio. Right. These guys, still good golfers, but also guys that really know how hard it is to grind out four days to win any tournament, let alone a major. And with the pipeline of great young golfers coming from every which way but loose, and they get bigger and younger and stronger, and they're coming from everywhere, you know, my only problem with the Saudi league is, and they're going to have to be really creative with a lot of these tournaments, I, I think, to make it exciting because we're so used to golf being an individual sport as much as we like the Ryder Cups and things like that is they're going to pay themselves out of an incentive to win and play well. Event, what The problem with giving 125, 150, 200 million is now you're just going to eventually pay guys to come out and play golf with you. You know, it's they're going to kind of eventually have that attitude. The one thing the PGA Tour offers is, is yes, you know, there is a grind, but there is a reward to get rich. There is a reward. And that reward to get rich is to play really good golf and to play consistently good golf. And that's what I think gives the PGA Tour them four days of real type of the fans that love golf and always have are going to always lock in on that PGA Tour. And whether it's a new guy you never heard of from Australia like Cam Smith, who hits it a mile and is now at, it has seven straight top tens, you can, you're not going to wait. You're going to be like, oh, I can't wait to see this kid in on this weekend against Adam Scott or whoever else didn't go over to the LIV. And, and so I think eventually – these paydays eventually eventually those dudes will end up where they make more money you'll end up back here because that's what we do we do two segments to the show brown and lawhead we'll be right back back with another side of the album browner and lawhead on the mightier 1090 esp and i'm john browner joined by jason lawhead as always monday through wednesday 6 p.m to 7 p.m we're using your drive to a Padre victory, hopefully. Something happened today that I, you know, I didn't expect to see. I'm not shocked. I actually you know what? That's a lie. I'm extremely shocked to see what occurred today. And the Angels have fired Joe Madden, World Series champion Joe Madden, and put Phil Nevin in that spot. Does this news shock you, Jason? A little bit. I'll be honest, a little bit. Um, I know they're in the 12-game losing streak, and they got off to a great start, and last year was a bit of a disappointment, and, uh, you know, trout back, people, you know, high expectations. But I think, I thought, at least, Madden is the kind of guy you go hire to also get you out of these kind of slumps, right? This isn't here. Yeah, this isn't year seven or eight, and it's just long dragged out, just bad baseball over time, and it just looks like you know da da da. This is you know kind of year one back with Trout and and Otani, you know, kind of you know coming into his like. I feel like he's the kind of manager, or at least a World Series title and and some years that he put in in Tampa um winning the game the amount of games he did there i i just feel like you hire a guy like that to also get you out of these slumps baseball's a long season you didn't lose 12 in a row going out at the end of an nba season to miss the playoffs you didn't lose you know tw 10 or 12 in a row in an nfl season i mean this is june and there's a <laughs> lot of baseball to play and you've got, you know, uh, you know, I just I, I so to me, that's shocking that the Angels who invested in a guy and went out and got a guy because of said credentials and said so many things he does right. Um, just goes and cans him in a 12 game losing streak in end of May, June. I, I do kind of find that shocking. What about you? I'm going to tell you this and I'm going to spare no ex I'm going to spare no, no, I'm not spare no rod, as they say in the Bible. The Angel organization is a joke. It's a massive <laughs> laughing stock. It has been for a very long time now. What they're doing is embarrassing. They allegedly, according to a lot of baseball people, have the best two players in baseball. Shohei Ofoni 
and Mike Trout. They supposed to have the best two players in baseball, and they cannot stop a 12-game losing streak. But they're so – these two players are so great. They're so great. This ain't Joe Madden's fault, man. Joe Madden's a good manager. Baseball's a long season, and it requires a lot of lever pulling. Everybody goes on losing streaks. 12 is pretty excessive, but that's not the reason to fire a manager. Now, I hope that it comes out that there are some things going on in the clubhouse that just, you know, a little too weird that they didn't like that Joe Madden was doing because he does weird stuff. But he's a motivator. He's a motivator. And the fact that these guys, and I'm going to, again, the fact that the people who tell you that love baseball, that know so much about baseball, that told y'all O'Phony was the greatest thing to ever pick a baseball in a bat up. 12 straight losses. Mike Trout, the best player in the history of the game up to this age with this many at-bats, with this many summers, and this many bases on the diamond. 12-game losing streak. When it was winning, nobody had a problem. So now you hit a snide. And what you do when you hit a snide, they panic because they're bad at baseball upstairs in Anaheim. They're bad at baseball upstairs. Yeah, they cut checks. Anthony Rendon, uh, Otani, they cut checks. They'll pay you. Albert Pujols, they'll pay you because that's all they can do. They can't, they can't negotiate. They don't win trades. They don't scout. They just pay. They pay. And when you just pay, you you know, you get what you pay for. And that's what they get. That's what I think. Yeah, you know, I mean, I'm looking at this losing streak, and uh, you look at the losing streak, and they lost to some pretty good teams. Hey, who, who, are you know. teams who are the teams on it? Give them to me. Well, they lost four straight to Toronto, who's playing that's good That's a good baseball. team. They lost three straight to the Yankees that no are playing exceptional that. baseball. Um. <clears throat> And then they lost uh, three straight to Philly, who, yeah, you know, yeah, well, Philly's been been up and down partially. You know, Philly's had uh, their issues, and I believe they fired their manager as well, but they've been playing unbelievable baseball since they fired Girardi. So, you know, you've got the Angels running into the Phillies post-Girardi when they started winning a bunch of games in a row. So, it's kind of, you know, you look at that 12 in a row and you go, I mean, I don't know. I, I sit there and I think, like I said earlier, not to be redundant, but, hey, we hired Joe Madden to to get us out of this. And look at the amount of one-run games in this streak, okay? One to nothing to Boston, two to one to New York, 11 to 10 to Toronto, six to five to Toronto, four to three to Toronto. So they lost, you know, that's, what did I name there? Six, half of those are one-run games. Yeah. Uh, they, so. Um, uh, I don't know. I mean, it's just to me, Phil Nevin. I mean, he's a baseball guy. He's been around, I guess. But um, is he the guy that's going to captain this team back to being able to be able to challenge the Houston Astros for the Western Division? Maybe. I, don't know, I mean, but I would have rather taken my chance with Madden at least deeper into the season. I mean, if twelve turns into sixteen or eighteen, and you don't write the ship, then. Phil Nevin's always there, I guess. You know, it's always like one of those things like, you know, you, know, you can't move away from Phil Nevin now, but you could have always waited to put him in to that seat as the season went on a little longer. But there had to be something where, you know, there had to be some type of discussion that Madden was finally like, well, then fire me. <laughs> I hope that there is something deeper going on and why they fired him. Because if they just fired him because they lost 12 games in a row, that's embarrassing. Like Joe, like this is Joe Madden's specialty, to be honest with you. Working working through things like this. But if if, yeah. but if if you find yourself in a situation where you pay where you went out and you sought this guy, you sought after this guy. He was the big hire that you had last year during the offseason. This was the guy. And he's already out. Yeah. Shocking. And, you know, especially when you sit there and if you're baseball people nowadays and you sit there and you go, hey, look, look where the Braves came from last year at the All-Star yes. break and even before the All-Star break. Right. Like, let, you know, let's 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 let, let's figure these things out. Let's go through these slumps. Hitters go through slumps. Pitchers go through slumps. Teams go through slumps. That's why there's 162 games. And They're you not can like write 25 games out of first place either. 
No, and they didn't lose this, like I said, this 12-game losing streak. No, they're still eight games out of first. They're still second place in the Western Division against, you know, probably if you, you sit there and you go Yankee, who, who, you know, if you had to pick who's the best team in the American League, yeah, the Yankees are playing great baseball. But if you look at the track record and who's also playing really good baseball and who's right up there at the top of the West again, 35 and 20, it's the Houston Astros. So they're, 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 they're nipping at them, and it, it, this wasn't some – you know, 12 game losing streak in, in August or September when you had a 10 game lead in first place and you've squandered it and peed it away. And, uh, you know, I just find it a, the timing strange timing since the post of the hire timing since everything uh, leading up to, you know, the players they've got. And like I said, kind of just hearkening back to looking at teams like the uh, Atlanta Braves, especially of last year, to say, hey, look, you know, you know, as long as you're in this, you're never out of it. You just got to start putting the pedal to the metal after the All-Star break and playing baseball. So, yeah, that's uh, yikes. Uh, from It's a big name out there on the market. I mean, you know, he said that guy's not going to be unemployed for long unless he just wants to sit in a booth and collect the checks that the Angels owe him. Because they got to pay. They got to <laughs> yeah. pay. But we know they will get good at one thing, paying. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, I got to tell you, man, this the Darvin Ham hire. The Darvin Ham hire is generating a lot of interesting comments today after the press conference that was held where people made a deal out of – this is how you know there's not a lot of news out there. People made a big deal out of Russell Westbrook being at the, the press conference. They made a big deal out of a couple of other guys who were there. Here's something funny that, that people should know. Russell Westbrook was there along with the other three guys who were there, Austin Reeves and, and a couple of other no-name guys, because they were working out. It was a mm -hmm. press conference with the new coach. It won't hurt you to walk over two minutes after your workout and watch the guy do a press conference. No. Like, it's not news that Russell Westbrook, was, Russell Westbrook was working out in the other room and stood in the next room over to watch the press conference. Like this, the NBA media, the NBA media and some media in general, the things that drive them wild, I simply don't understand it. And this is one of the things I simply don't understand. Will Darvin Ham be a good coach? I don't know. He let go three of his assistants today that were on Frank Vogel's staff. No shock there. Um, but what type of what type of team is he going to build? How is it going to look? And what kind of system are they going to run? That's all that matters. That's the only thing people should be focused on. This idea that everybody's making a big deal out of who was there and what he said. It doesn't matter what you said in the press conference because he wasn't going to give you nothing that you could use. Like, oh, yeah, no, we're trading Russell Westbrook. Oh, he's standing right there. Like, hey, we trading AD. Oh, hey, he said Westbrook is one of the best players in the game, one of the best players in history. That's a fact. Anthony Davis is the key to the Lakers' success. That's a fact. LeBron James still has a lot left in the tank. That's a fact. What what else did you expect him to say? Yeah, I mean, it was just, you know, it was a regular press conference. It's yes. the Lakers though with LeBron. <laughs> and so More it's got to be it's got to be, well, I'm just saying, you know, it's the Lakers with the LeBron era and all of the mess that came afterwards and you know, but hey, good luck to Darvin Ham. I mean, yeah. I, I I hope yeah you know, the guy yeah you know, at the end of the day it's you know LeBron. This doesn't seem like it seems like a no win situation. Just ask Frank Vogel because he won a title and got fired. I mean, so he won and still lost. Yeah, so it's really it's literally the one of the most no win situations you can ever be up against. So. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, the guy played a little bit in the league. He's been a, he's been an assistant coach with the Bucks, but uh, that's not going to mean anything until you know next season. Uh, getting these three guys along with the rest of the roster to play together at a at a championship level, not just play together and get. It. I mean, we're talking about like the expectations of this team. I mean, they couldn't even make Championship. the, the play-in game. I mean, this, yeah, no, you're talking about, you know, three guys. Like, these, this should be a polished championship contender, and that's not all on the coach. I mean, these guys have to make the steps. These are veterans. These are great players in this league uh, uh, that can play at a high level, 
um, that have to be able to put something together to, to become a championship team. And so he's ham has got his work cut out for him because that's the challenge here is creating what's already on paper, a championship contender into the product on the floor. And they're far away from it, at least in the Westbrook edition experience and what they've surrounded uh, that, that new look roster post a bubble championship. I mean, it's, it's, you know, and there's not a lot of excuses. You know, the West is right there for it. There isn't a whole big uphill climb to get, you know, your position in the West. There's a few good teams. And after that, there's a lot of teams that in my mind are not made up of championship contender material like this Laker team. This team needs to be driven by Russell Westbrook. And here's because you can't trade him. I know we've been over this a million times. Yeah. You can't trade him. And LeBron can play in any system because he's that talented. And AD will do whatever LeBron tells him to do because he's pretty much a coward. So with that being said, Darvin Ham just needs to go to Russell Westbrook and say, listen, this is what I need you to do. And these other guys will fall in line. You let me worry about you. Let me and Rashid get LeBron in a room. And you, you, we'll take it from there. That's it. We'll talk. Rashid and Darvin Ham will talk to LeBron. LeBron will talk to AD. We need you to listen to me and let it everything take care of itself. Because if you do anything other than that, it'll turn into what it turned into last year. Because Darvin Ham's not a trainer. He's not a phys- he's not in charge of physical rehab. And the problem with the team last year, they were hurt. AD hurt. LeBron hurt. The only person not hurt Westbrook. So. You take the person who's going to play the most and put yeah. most, put most of the weight on their shoulders. Because again, Darvin Ham ain't a trainer, bro. Darvin Ham yeah. not some injury guru. He's they're going to go through injuries, even in a good. You know, that's what's good. They're, they're going to have to be able to be a team that can navigate AD missing some games, LeBron missing some games. Um, because even if these guys aren't seriously injured next year, they're going to take their injury. They're going to take their nights. They're going to have their bumps and bruises because they always do. Even at the best, they always have their bumps and bruises, and they're going to have to have some stretches of games that they just don't go concede for, you know, uh, because there are a couple of guys aren't in there. They've got to be that kind of team, too. And while we're on the NBA, I, I, that's something that happened. It, this also came up today, and this is part of the uh, collective bargaining agreement and the and the meetings that the NBA is having. Because in, in the NBA finals, most of the uh, the NBA kind of uses that as a conference for guys to meet and kind of go over the rules and things that they're looking forward to next year. There has been a lot of talk about uh, lessening the games, taking it from 82 to 72 to 58. Like, I'm going to tell you right now, if the NBA – takes the games from an 82-game season down to anything other than 82 games, it will tarnish the NBA. I know some people look at it as, oh, the, is, it's too many regular season games. How much is enough for you? Because whether it's 56, 72, or 82, you're not watching them all. The only person that watches every game is people who cover the league. Even the most diehard fan doesn't watch every game. They just don't. So the idea that you're going to now go from 82 games to 72 games or 62 games or whatever you want to say, whatever you want to say, you've now put in jeopardy every record, every, every personal record, every team record, and every contract. You've also now put in jeopardy every television contract. Because if I'm ESPN, if I'm Turner, I gave you billions of dollars for live television programming. And now you're telling me you're going to cut out almost 15 to 20 percent of what I paid you for. Okay. Okay. Give me my money back. And that's not going to happen. Or give it to me at a discount. And that's not going to happen. So so people because CJ McCollum was on television today. To his credit, said that he would not be in favor of a 50 something game season. But also he wouldn't be against a 72 game season. And to me, even still. To me, that is a no. Well, as much as I'd like to, I, as much as I'm, I, as much as I like the romance of the idea of a, say, 62 game schedule, 
that's only based on the idea of that's what it should have been for so many years. But I, I don't, I don't like, I'm not romanced on the idea of just changing it now. Right. I just, I just, like you said, for the records, for everything, for everything that we compare things to if for just the fact that it's been an 82 game schedule, whether it's too much for the fans or too much for certain players play the 82 games uh, rest when you have to. Uh, uh, there's a lot of great ball players out there that can fill in and sign 10 day contracts and keep the wheels moving. The, the game's going to keep being played and you got to try to go out and play good basketball every night. And that's just the way the league is. That's the NBA. And it's just never going to happen. Like you said, from the top of it all, from TV contracts to the players unions retirement and how, what's going to get paid into that and what's going to get factored into that from all these the lost revenues of certain things. I mean, how about these cities? How about these cities that put out leases with these teams for these arenas? Yes. You think you think these cities are going to be like, yeah, 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 sure. Eliminate 30, eliminate 15 home games in our city downtown where we built this arena and gave you a tax break to build this arena so we could have restaurants open and jobs and people working, you know, maybe full time or vendors or whatever, seasonal jobs. Yeah, 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 sure. Make my, make my uh, you know, city look like crap on paper in the next three years when it comes to these types of figures. No, there. So you're going to get a lot of backlash from these types of things that have, these cities have leases with these you know, teams and these arenas and, and what they expect you know, revenue wise and, and, and the things that go along with it. So, um, it's, it's chatter, it's talk, it's, you know, it's, it's not ever, I don't think it's ever, the only way they could ever do that is if they really got it fun. You want to go make it, if you want to really cut it, if you want to not just take it to 72, but really make it dent, then guess what? You're going to have to have a full tournament where everybody can get at least enough games played to get it back close to that 80. Uh. So, but I'm just saying, you're going to yes, have yes, to have yes. a everybody's in it tournament. An alternative. A mid-season, a mid-season tournament, if you will. A mid-season tournament or the season's just uh, – the season's a race to 50 games and it feels like a college basketball season on an NBA level because it goes so quick over a few months and everybody gets in the tournament no matter if you're a 30 seed or a 1 seed and you play – what, however you design it to make it exciting to keep all these oh. cities and fans in, invested and to get them back to at least the players playing upwards close to 80 games, even if they don't go towards the, the final finals, because obviously we know the teams that play in playoffs and get to the finals will end up playing so all you know, these 100 young, games. To, to all these young legs and these young NBA players looking to get the same amount of money with, with less games played, I got news for you, player. It ain't going to happen. And on the last note, at 40 years old, Michael Jordan played all 82 games. I think yeah. at 27, some of you suckers can salvage the legs. Brown and Lawhead, see y'all tomorrow. Peace. Peace.